Hello, I'm Robert, and I'm going to talk about this WHO conference today. And the key message is that with the right measures, COVID-19 can be contained. And as before, I'm just going to talk through his presentation, because I get some people say it's too technical and not quite sure what he's saying. So I'll explain, I'll just go through what he said. So, um, first of all, he said that... Uh, he gave the figures and everything. He said that uh, the rest of the world is now the greatest concern outside China. With 3,474 cases, 44 countries and 54 deaths. He said this is a decisive point. For the last two days, there have been more new cases outside China than inside it. In the last day, there have been seven new countries. And he lists them there. Brazil, Georgia, Greece, North Macedonia, Norway... Pakistan and Romania. And his message to all those countries is, this is our window of opportunity. If you act aggressively now, you can contain the virus. You can prevent people getting sick and you can save lives. And we say we have to act, move swiftly and contain it at its start. And then he says the epidemics in Iran, Italy and South Korea show what the virus is capable of. But it's not influenza. With the right measures, it can be contained. And that's one of the key messages from China. And the evidence is that there isn't widespread community transmission. In Guangdong province, then they tested 320,000 samples in the community and only 0.01% were positive for COVID. And that's about 32 out of 320,000. And that suggests containment is possible. That's a minute number that they found. And there are many countries that have done exactly that. So he gave a list here. There are several countries that have not reported a single case, new case, for more than two weeks. And had it originally. Belgium, Cambodia, India. It's a big country. You know, three cases, three recovered. No new cases for two weeks. Nepal, Philippines, the Russian Federation, Sri Lanka and Vietnam. And they're each different, but they all show that aggressive early measures can prevent transmission before the virus gets a foothold. And of course, that doesn't mean that they won't have more cases. And as of Tuesday, Finland and Sweden both reported no cases for more than two weeks, but then had two, both had new cases yesterday in Finland and in Sweden. He said every country must be ready for its first case, the first cluster, the first evidence of community transmission at the low level, and for dealing with sustained community transmission, such as they had in Wuhan. And no country must assume it won't get cases. That would be a fatal mistake, and quite literally. He said it doesn't respect borders, it doesn't respect races or ethnicities, it has no regard for a country's GDP or level of development. So the point is not only to prevent it getting to your shores, but what you do when you have cases, because you're not going to prevent it said, we're not hopeless, we're not helpless. Every country needs to be ready to detect cases early, to isolate patients, to trace contacts and provide quality community care, prevent hospital outbreaks and prevent community transmission. So that's clear enough what those four levels are. Four things are, you've got to isolate quality in the patients, you've got to trace all the contacts of Every, everyone who tests positive. You've got to provide community care for, uh, for the people who uh, are dealing with this. You've got to prevent outbreaks in hospitals and you've got to prevent community to community transmission by proper hygiene and distancing and so on. And so he said the vital questions every country must be asking today, are we ready for the first case? And and what we do when it arrives, do we have an isolation unit ready to go right now? Do we have enough oxygen, ventilators and other vital, vital equipment if the case goes severe? Oh dear, I'm pressing, pressing a button. And how would we know if the case is in other places in the country? And do we have a reporting system for the health facilities and a way to raise an alert? So that if someone comes into your your and someone brings you up and says, you know, we've got someone who might, and uh, and then 
they notice that they've got the symptoms that resemble this to have the, everything in place to quickly deal with that. And do the health workers have the training and equipment? And do they know how to take the samples correctly? And do they have the right measures at the airports and board crossings? And do the labs have the right chemicals? So we want all that sorted out in advance before it gets there. You don't want the lab to be much saying, oh, I haven't got such a correct chemical, and they've got to go and, and, and buy it or get it in before they can test the samples. And are they ready for the severe and critical disease to our Hospitals and clinics have the right procedures. Do the people know what to do there? And do the people have the right information? And do they know what the disease looks like? And he said a little bit about the disease. It's not what he knows. In 90, uh, not usually. 90% of cases is a fever. 70% is a dry cough. And then, are we ready to fight rumours and misinformation with clear and simple messages that people can understand? Are we able to have our people on our side to fight this outbreak? And then I was looking at this video online and just scrolling down, comment after comment after comment, saying that he's lying, they're deceiving us, and he's misinformed and so on. And we've got the media doing this as well, and, and all the fake rumours. We've got to counteract that. And we've got to deal with a situation where people are on the side of the people who know what they're doing and to fight this outbreak. And these are questions that every health minister must be ready to answer now. And these can prepare us. And these questions, getting uh, right answers to those, will be the difference between one case and a hundred cases in a country in the coming days and weeks. And if the answer to any of these questions is no, your country has a gap that this virus will exploit. So even developed countries could be surprised, we've already seen a surprise in Italy, and there could be more. So a message continues to be that this virus has pandemic potential, and the WHO is providing the tools to help every country to repair accordingly. And they have shipped testing kits to 57 countries, personal protective equipment to 85 countries, and trained more than 80,000 health workers through online courses in multiple languages and operational gu guidelines with concrete actions and key performance in indicators and estimated resources that they need to repair and respond to a cluster of up to 100 cases. That's where you've got to start. But that's not enough, so we'll do more. And the WHO stands ready to support every country to develop its national plan. And he said, this is not a time for fear. It's a time for taking action now to prevent infections and save lives now. Fear and panic doesn't help. People have concerns, and rightly so. People can be worried, and rightly so. But the most important thing is to calm down and do the right things to fight this very dangerous virus. And people do calm down. If you tell them what to do, and you say, this is what you've got to do, then it's something, the, the actual action of working on it, that, that really does have a very calming effect. So anyway, uh, down to the questions and answers. So this was about the Tokyo Olympics. We don't need to go into much about that. You're just saying that there's no decision so far. WHO will work with them. Everyone is monitoring the situation. First case in South America, then uh, you get people saying, oh, Brazil won't be able to cope. Well, Brazil does have pretty good health care, actually, but it's you know, not, not very even. Um, but um, he said that Brazil has... Uh, as a strong, so such measures, how does that apply when the local health system is already in trouble? Brazil has a strong capability of dealing with quite serious epidemics. So, sorry for that digression. And if we look at the dengue ep epidemic, the yellow fever, and uh, it's front line, it was the front line to seek a response. So the risk management in Brazil and South America in general, public health has a proud and scientific and evidence-based history. And so he says, it's disappointing to see South America, another continent. And we were speaking with the regional director, and they're already providing direct support to Brazil in this matter. But it's, it's not like he's especially concerned with South America, as they, they can cope with it. And I think we need to be careful to make assumptions on whether it will spread or not. And then, uh, so that was the question about, uh, can it... The novelty because of tropical conditions 
will it spread in tropical conditions? It never has been infected a country with tropical conditions before. And he is saying that uh, that we need to be careful by making assumptions about whether it will spread or not. So we can't assume it's going to be like SARS and MERS and it might spread. They just don't know. It, uh, and a bit of background to that. Bruce, as Dr. Bruce said yesterday, the day before yesterday, that it is spreading in the very hottest parts of China. Admittedly, it's winter in China, but even the warmest parts of it, it is spreading, which suggests it may be less sensitive to temperature than SARS is. So they don't know if it can spread in Brazil. And he said, it's in your control to be able to stop this and to do what you can to limit any onward transmission, regardless of where this virus shows up. The approach is the same. So now we come to the question about Iran. And um, the uh, Iranian uh, questioner asked, Iran has a 26 death poll in patients uh, with, uh, confirmed with it, 245, which unfortunately means one in 10 is, is going to die. And that's the uh, 26 died out of 245. But outside China, it's 2%. So how does WHO explain it being five times bigger? And so he explains there that he, that he, he thinks it's mainly unseen and undetected cases. It may be a much broader outbreak. Yet there may be many more who have got the mild symptoms. This is often the start the case at the beginning of an epidemic. You want to see the extreme end. And he says that Iran has dealt with many emergencies in the past. And its history of earthquake and disaster response and emergency medical team has shown a very high clinical capacity for managing severely ill patients in Iran. So he don't, doesn't expect it to be anything to do with clinical care. I was mentioning the other day that Iran is a health tourism hotspot. They uh, earn 1.8 billion in 2017 to 18 from health tourists who go there for the medical care from India and Pakistan and parts of Europe. So they suddenly have high-tech medical gear. They actually make high-tech medical gear that they export to the rest of the world, like, like scanners and so on. Uh, he went on to say, so anyway, he, he said we would expect a surveillance steps up that more cases are identified and that we're in the milder range. Uh, he, then the US has only already confirmed one case of community transmission. And they asked how many countries are having community and how many human to human. And the, the report will be posted later today, so I'll check up and see if I can find that. And it said there are many scenarios. First cases, clusters and community transmissions and the vast majority of the countries are still in the importation phases. So they've only got one case or two or a few cases that have just come in and haven't been infected in the country itself. Then we have some localised clusters. Give the example of Singapore, well traced and controlled through public health me measures means they, they know exactly how everyone in Singapore got infected. They trace it all up. And although it's nine, over 90 cases, it's completely under control and understood. And others in South Korea and Japan, they are mainly clusters where everything is traced and some identification transmission at the community level. I just explain what he means by transmission at the community level. That means that you have people pop up and they've got the disease and you don't know how they got it. And they may have got it just from... So then the question arises, I mean, the, it's very easy to do contact tracing for this new virus, because it's generally it's transmitted by people in very close proximity who know each other, like in a household. And community transmission is like when if it's like a school or in a in an underground or something, or you know, just in the crowds, it just gets, gets spread around. You don't know where it came from originally. And uh, they're, they're finding very little evidence of transmission in that, in that sort of a way. It doesn't seem to happen, almost never. And uh, so South Korea they're, they're, uh, they're, and Japan, they're mainly clusters still. And some evidence of transmission at community level, but there's a lot of work going in, so they're trying to link the clusters together back. And if they can link the clusters all back to people who knew people who knew people, then it's, no, it's not community transmission, it's a cluster. And they've just linked all the clusters together. So the key question for Italy and Iran is how much is it clustered? how much at the community level. 
I think the recent reports from Italy an awful lot of it is clustered. They managed to trace it all back to patient one. And that would be the great question for Iran. And if they can do that, then it's still at this stage of clusters and not yet just maybe the beginning of community transmission. And so how you respond to it depends on the stage it's at. Then there's a question from Rwanda about, uh, uh, yes, about training and about how large is the budget for preparedness. And he said uh, it's his continent in WH that has expressed the greatest concern. Most countries have weaker healthcare systems and investing as much as possible and increased diagnostic capacity. And he said uh, originally all except a couple of were sending samples to other areas. And now more than 40 countries have the ability to test in country. And he says the, he wants the African continent to respond in a coordinated fashion. And this was a big lesson from China, very important to coordinate between the different regions. And he's, he's saying to, we've got to do the same with the entire African continent. All the contact tracing and knowledge about what's happening everywhere and uh, and just keeping keeping all working together and, and unified description of cases and things like that which the WHO are encouraging around the world and so uh, anyway he said last week he had a meeting to agree on continent-wide response and preparedness and national preparedness and response he said it was a very productive meeting and and they were able to understand the gaps that the countries had and the WHO are going to continue to support the address gaps and concerns. And he said most of those 80,000 trainees are from Africa, the online trainees, but they have these online courses for people who are, um, who are not very experienced in the measures they're going to have to do to contain this disease. And he says that's not enough. They're going to continue to train more and aggressively training health workers in all countries. Mike, uh, Mike Ryan said 85 countries receiving vital PPE supplies. PPE, I'm not sure what the acronym is, but it's, it's, it's supplies to protect yourself personally. Perhaps I, someone could tell me what PPE means, or I'll find out. Anyway, the head of uh, interventions, and they've got multi country training going on, and there's another one next week, and he gave all the list of things. I said Africa is used to dealing with epidemics, a great deal of resilience and coping can be given. Capacity. We need to give them the resources, training, and extra help those systems need. They've talked about that before, and they've got a whole series of labs and things. And, and to do with the Ebola outbreak, for instance, in order to deal with that, they had to give those countries the capabilities of labs and things like that. They had to build up those capabilities, so those are there. And they have quite a few capabilities in the country. It's a matter of coordinating them together and getting them to work together. And, and then reinforcing where there were gaps. And he said, however, and, and so in Africa dealing with measles, yellow fever, monkeypox, Ebola, and places extra strain on the health system. But every nation on the planet has vulnerable communities, all the people, people with underlying medical conditions. So we need to build these capacities everywhere. And that's another thing that Dr. Bruce said the other day, that even in Western, you know, like here in the UK, we don't have lots of empty beds. Our uh, health system, like everyone's health system, tends to be running at capacity, especially during the flu season in the UK. So if, if we get a, a big outbreak here in the UK, we will still have problems. It will be much easier to find the finance for it. But we need to do the preparedness. We don't want to be rushing around and uh, wasting special days, uh, extra days, as we try to get extra beds and isolation wards and they just aren't there. We need to be ready to rush to run out those I have those isolation beds bears ready. Like how many how many can we clear an entire uh, just even just entire uh, wing of a hospital to be free for for dealing with coronavirus patients? Could we do that within within a few hours or within a day? And uh, so that's why developed countries have the same problems, have the same issues if it if it goes large then we're not necessarily ready unless we put in the readiness preparation. So it's not just Africa, everyone has to do this. And Maria said that they, that they also do all this through teleconferences and 
and China especially, they've got all the experts in China and they need to share uh, their expertise with the world through virtual meetings, sharing experience with each other and we all need to be doing that. People talking live, the experts in all the countries talking about their experiences live via teleconferencing, saying this is how you do it, this is how we do it in China, this works, give this a go, you know, this sort of thing. And then on the diagnostic criteria, he said the diagnostic criteria and case definitions always evolve. And the best way to make definitive diagnosis is the laboratory test. So I had misunderstood yesterday when I was summarised what Bruce said. He wasn't, Dr. Bruce was saying, he wasn't saying that we should use CT scans instead of the laboratory test. He, see, he was saying that the CT scans were very effective in, in finding them early once a big outbreak was underway in China. And so this is, the, and this is what uh, I think Dr. Tetros was in my choir, I can't remember who was speaking here, but he said yes, in the middle of a very large outbreak, X-ray and CT scan can be predictable of the disease. Because there's this new news from China, that 97% or something of the cases could be detected very early using a CT scan, which is a new discovery they made. But it's not going to prove that this is what you've got. But if you're in, in a uh, situation where you've got an epidemic situation in your country and you've got loads and loads of cases, if you can do CT scans early, then you can catch them before you can even detect the virus. And so that then can help alter its tracks in that situation. But he's not saying that we should be doing CT scan of everyone because he said that the many cases, that if you've got a big, it depends on the numbers. So if you've only got if you've got loads and loads of pneumonia cases and you try testing everyone, then a few of them will resemble the uh, and give you a false positive. And it's only once you've got an epidemic underway, then it's worth testing everyone, and the few false positives aren't going to matter because you're finding, because you've, lots, you've got lots and lots of, the, of these uh, COVID-19 cases to discover, and you discover the fame quickly before you can even find the virus. But you don't want to go around um, finding uh, false positives in a large population of thousands, of tens of thousands of people and you find a few people who don't have it and you think they have, that's not going to work. So, uh, and still, the best is the validated test. And two weeks ago, only Senegal and South Africa had that capability. Yesterday, almost everybody in Africa has the capability and where they don't. So the few countries that don't is technical logistics, transport, customs and other issues. Now, he doesn't actually name the countries, so that's another question that came up later. Then uh, he, he won't say uh, these are the two countries that don't have the capabilities. But I think it is because of respect for the countries and not to, to kind of highlight their shortcomings. So, uh, it, he doesn't, and he hasn't, and they have, although they have a list of 30 countries that are most in need, that are getting urgent, that are getting urgent attention, it's not a published list, it's private and people outside the WHO don't get to see this list. Um, so, uh, and that is the talk about the, the delay when you uh, diagnose a person, then, sort of like Brazil, they sent it off and they need to send it to the national labs for uh, a much better lab for testing, for uh, confirming. He said, uh, what should you do? Well, he said, when it's a very low incidence, the issue is to get the t test done at a properly validated, high-quality lab. So, uh, and you can take wait 48 hours for that better, for validate yourself from a good lab than trying to guess work. I mean, you wouldn't, especially you wouldn't say, oh, you've turned out negative, because you want to double-check that as well. But, um, so, I think that's what you're saying. I, mean, if, I hope I haven't misunderstood. Anyway, you, you, want, you want, if you've got a positive, you want that checked as well. You certainly want that checked. So he said, it's better validate result than trying to rely on guesswork. And he said, but what you have to do is to act as if it is um, a, a case and start all the contact tracing and, uh, and you, the quarantining and everything as if you were certain it was COVID-19. But then, and you shouldn't be waiting for the results of the test to begin the public health measures. And if necessary, you, you tell you tell all the contact, contacts to stay at home, you, you take whatever measures you need, as if it was the case. And then you wait, and then 48 hours is confirmed. It normally would be confirmed, but sometimes it won't. 
So, uh, and then he says that it's uh, that, it, that it's best to start moving from at most have large countries and maybe just one lab in the entire country or a few labs. You need to move down to it at the state level. So in the United States, every single state would have would have the capability. Then to counties. So for instance, in the UK, every single county in the UK uh, should in, uh, have this capability. It's best at this subnational level, especially for large countries. I, I mean, our garden and butte, we've got a huge county here. Uh, so, uh, I, yeah, so, but that would be Glasgow, I would imagine. They, they, they're well, well supplied. Anyway, so um, the more uh, new cases outside and inside China, what would he mean by saying it's a decisive point? And he said, it's a positive side. Uh, could, could the containment measure, there's a positive side and a negative side of the story. The containment measures in China, uh, we can see a decline in the cases and it will ultimately be contained. He seems pretty confident it's going to be contained in China. Although the Chinese experts, Bruce, would say, they, they would say, don't say it's contained yet. But uh, it looks like it ultimately will be contained. Well, on the other side, there's the increase in the rest of the world is bad news, especially those three countries, Italy, Iran and South Korea. And then he's talked again about his four cases. And expect, and, uh, we've already got Italy, a member of the G7, and it can really surprise. You can expect other G7 countries to be surprised in a similar way. So the delicate situation can go either way. And uh, how are we handling it and how are we able to handle it? It says whether we get it wrong or right is in our hands. When we handle it well, we get positive results. When we don't handle it right, we saw what the consequences are in some countries. It's very important to get handled right. And it's quite a little series of questions uh, that they joked about being too many. So how many arms did it cost? How concerned masks about mask being shortage, Trump, and uh, using the case definition. So it's set up the cost, it's less than five dollars. Uh, others for the WHO, but others might cost more. And um, supply of masks. Then the clinic the two things, the clinical masks people buy in the streets and they're not so concerned about that and then there's N95 or FFP2 and 3 respiratory masks and then the others um, are needed with clinical care environment and they've been trying to protect those supplies and the Director General Ted Ross has been writing previously to all the manufacturers and producing countries and of course sold out not just the national level also the private sector and he asked for national strategic stockpiles in countries with larger strategic reserves to be able to provide, um, so he's asking countries to build up these stockpiles and the countries with larger reserves to provide the masks to countries that may not have them uh, in an emergency. He says that the WHO themselves have a global supply centre in the UAE, in the United Arab Emirates, in Dubai, and they supply those 85 countries from there. They continue to supply, but there's a significant strain, and also there's uh, uh, something called the pandemic supply chain network and th and they're using that as well and there are also lots of independent distributors and they're working with those networks I wouldn't be able to, I just typed it as he talked most of it and there's some more details in there and especially the pressure points in the system particularly respiratory masks and also the UN supply chain coordination and as for case definitions he said it, 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 it this isn't the time and then we just go on and it takes ages to talk about all the nuances and the changes of the current case definitions. And then he was asked, is it like flu? So um, Trump said in his, uh, in his press conference that uh, we could treat it like flu. And so he was asked, is this, did Trump give the correct advice or is this simplistic? And he said, yes, if asked to advise community spread virus, give exactly the same advice as flu. Wash hand with soap, don't rub face, and stand at six feet. So that regards the same. Scientifically, it's not the flu, but there are many things in common and can it in exactly the same way. So the president is right to say that, treat it like the flu. From the practical point of view of the general public, not from the scientific point of view of the researchers. And then he says, uh, you ask about why people don't wear masks in, in Europe, only the poor states. And he said the medical mask 
He said our guidance is to wear them only if the patients themselves have respiratory signs and wear them to protect others. And be careful how you wear them, there's instructions on their site. And it's important for the surgical masks, uh, then it, you, it's not important to tell everyone in Europe to wear them. We have to prioritise it to frontline workers. If we have shortages for people who really need it in the hospital, and also people taking care of other people at home. And so if you've got a cold, sick, you, I think what they said, she was saying, meant was if you've got a bit of a, a fluy symptoms and you're, you're coughing and so on, you're taking care of someone else, then you would wear a mask at home in order to protect the people you're looking after. And um, some experts say that the people can be infectious in the incubation period. What is the risk now? And the answer, he said, and that's why I said was my big thing yesterday, going through that Bruce's, Dr. Bruce's presentation. And he said that the, uh, the data suggests that, it's, that these are not the driving uh, force. And it's becoming a myth. It's becoming an urban myth. People sharing it around online and all these fake news and so on. It's not true. And this has become more and more clear. And if anyone's saying it, even scientists, if they're still saying this, then they're out of date. They're, they're, they're out of date thinking from a few days ago. And he's not saying that scientifically someone can't be infectious because they're sick. That could happen. But the vast majority is from symptomatic individuals to other individuals. And none of the data show that asymptomatic individuals are driving it. It was very, very clear from the big study in China. It's not asymptomatic individuals that are driving it. And anyone who says it is, they're just out of date. It's a rapidly evolving situation. Before that report was published, then it wasn't entirely clear. And it's still possible to suppose that there's a fair bit of asymptomatic transmission. Now it's absolutely clear there isn't. It's a very, very minor part of it. So then, um, hands to the face, he's talking about uh, how many people in the audience put their hands to the face in the last 20 minutes. And so, um, so it's about, we've, we've got to learn these new practices. So I'm trying to not put my hand to my face so often. So, you know, very normal, I would normally touch my face very often. And I'm trying to get out of that habit. And that's quite a good thing to do if you, uh, even though I, I, I just live in my house by myself and there's nobody, you know, there's nobody even to infect here and I, do, I only go to the shop for some once a week or two and uh, there's not going to be many people that I risk infecting at the moment even if I had the flu. But uh, still, it's good to get into this habit. And um, if, if, when I'm out in the city, sometimes when I'm you know, being more sociable, going around and seeing people, then uh, I'll, I'll be following their advice uh, uh, for flu. And also, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm over 60, I don't want to, to um, get flu. And uh, I'm over 65. And um, no, I'm over, I forget my age. I'm 54, what, uh, 20, yeah, 60, I'm over 65, that's right. Yes. I'm not, always, I'm not just over 60, I'm over 65. I think I'm 66 this year. So anyway, uh, I, I often do that. I, I forget which year it was. Because when you get to my age, and you, you maybe can get a bit hazy, and you can sort of flip back to a decade ago and forget how old you are. Well, I, I do anyway. Anyway, never mind. So um, uh, some uh, some issues for... Uh, so... Uh, most countries have action plans for polio. So I've got to the end now. And it's, uh, it's rather similar in length. That's, that's getting quite typical when I go through some rising. And, and so, uh, yeah, and that was the thing about the priority. He said that he didn't even give a number. He wouldn't give a list. 30 or 40, there's a high level of risk and vulnerability. But this is uh, private to the WHO and they're not going to share it with, them, with the world as, at large as to saying, you know, as to name calling these countries as being as being the ones with weaker healthcare systems. That's not what they're about. Um, but they're doing their best to make sure that all these people are supported. Uh, that's it. So, I hope that was helpful. 
and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if, if there's anything that, that you didn't understand about what I said. I've done my best to explain. And really, I, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure why people find it so technical, because it didn't seem very technical to me. And I've, there have only been a few points here and there. But I suppose these minor points kind of throw you, and you you lose track of what he's saying or something. He, he wasn't very technical, but uh, I, I mainly just fed out what he said. But anyway, hopefully this helps some of you to, to understand a bit better what he was saying. And then later, if I get a bit of time, I might try and do a kind of write-up of this as well. Oh yes, and so, mind to everyone, do, do subscribe to this channel uh, if you want to, and uh, see more of this. Um, I'm doing this for Doomsday Bunt on Facebook, and uh, so if you get scared by these things, do join our group. And if you're good at helping people and reassuring people, you also very much welcome people who are, who are used to um, working with uh, autistic people, many of our members are autistic, or working with people with, uh, who are panicking and scared and with mental health issues such as PTSD. And uh, if you're just used to talking to people like that, then you may well be able to come and help in a group. And anyone at a human level can help, uh, can just help by being a kind person and you know, just caring for the others in the group. And then if there's any of you who are good at fact-checking, we very much welcome uh, people who are, are good at just, if you've got an academic background, especially if you're good at being able to present things to the general public as well and you know, check things up. But just to be, if you're good at checking things, it doesn't need to be expertise. I know absolutely nothing about medicine, but uh, I know how to read an academic paper. I know how to check, how to find out which are the most reliable sources in this particular field. Then I identified very early on that the WHO are the most reliable source, and Dr. Tedros is by far he's an absolute expert on this, and uh, he has intuitions. So uh, Dr. Bruce was saying yesterday that he and the other experts they just didn't believe that that China could be doing. What they're doing and uh, they just had this received in wisdom and the flu can't be contained and they just can't and things like COVID the, the SARS can't be contained in this way and so when they went and did their report and they went to China and they were very surprised to find that China has been containing it and absolutely definitely absolutely clear that they have it's probably partly because of the very low level of community transmission and that makes it much easier for them to do the contact tracing. And uh, but anyway, uh, Dr. Bruce was uh, Bruce Alward or Alward, what was his name? Hilbert. I can't now I, I get confused about his name. But he was praising um, um, Dr. Tedros, the uh, director general of the World Health Organization. He was saying that he had an intuition at a very early stage because he has been saying right from the very beginning that we have to do this. You know, that we've that um, we've got to uh, stop it, uh, quarantine, and we've got to just stop it spreading, and and it's partly because of him saying that over and over again that the rest of the world has been stopping it, instead of just letting it move like a pandemic, like a like the flu, where they wouldn't have been, uh, done such vigorous stopping. So he immediately, even without the scientific evidence from China, then uh, he's he immediately uh, right from early on recognised that Chinese was doing, that it was actually working, just from the hints, that, it, that it, even when it was going up almost exponentially, but not quite, at that point he was already saying, look, China doing something, there's something new going on, we've never seen this before, just just from his expert eye of looking at what they were doing, and just looking at the curve with minimal data. So, um, Dr. Tedros is uh, he's very ex experienced, very expert, been involved in many epidemics and he's obviously the top person to go to on this particular topic and then and then you work down from there so you start that's that's the best way to do this sort of thing we find who knows most of all and who's best understanding of it find the top level of review with the IPC, with climate change the IPCC with the, the WHO it's Dr Tedros I would say him as a person and his advisors then that's where you start and then from everything else from there and then when they say things there you will then follow up what he said 
and so anyway, so uh, if if you're any, if you're good at this sort of thing, like what I'm doing now, then again we very much welcome you in the group. It doesn't need to be academic reading papers. It can be any form of you know how to identify who are the people. So for instance, with uh, Iran war, then it was retired generals. They don't, don't write papers typically, but they know all about uh, about wars and and wars and peace and uh, and where, where there's a risk of war. So for that I relied on generals, retired generals, because the active generals tend not to uh, talk so much, but the retired generals are very willing to give that analysis of the situation. So they were my top source on the Iran situation, it continues to be, rather than military theorists who are not always the best sources on war. Anyway, so anyway, uh, so welcome you in the group and be sure to read the guidelines at the top of the group uh, if you, if you, and before you join and, and before you start posting, because they're very important, it's how it works. Doomsday Debunk on Facebook. I'll give a link to this in the video description and a link to our group. And that I think is all I need to do.